Welcome to the Food Professor Podcast, presented by Cattle, season four, our last live You and Me episode of the season. I'm Michael LeBlanc. And I'm the Food Professor, Sylvain Chalabois. Our special guests, plural, uh, this week are, first of all, Victor Thomas, President and CEO of Canada India Business Council, not for profit working to strengthen the Canadian or Canada India Economic Corridor by promoting bilateral investment and trade. We talk about the nature and scale of the opportunity for Canadian agriculture and feeding that enormous and complicated nation. Uh, the political regulatory considerations surrounding trade uh, with India at scale. I believe you know or knew Victor, right? Oh, He's yeah. From my student. days in Saskatchewan. Uh, he was oh, a student, yeah, no. right? He yeah, was a student that's right. Yeah, great student. Uh, Great student of life. Uh, he's been involved with the business community forever. And mm -hmm. uh, I think he was actually president of the Chamber of Commerce for uh, for a while, under the age of 30, by the wow. way. Made and to do so, the job. Yeah, yeah, very, very influential. Love him. I see him all the time at airports. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and frankly, I mean, the last time I saw him, I think it was in Calgary and told him, listen, uh, I have a podcast uh, mm. and we need to talk about India because I think India is an important yeah. partner for Canada. So sure. he accepted and here we are. Also joining us with proprietary, found only here on the Food Professor Podcast Research, we're talking to almost 10,000 Canadians, thanks to cattle about their perceptions of cashiers and associates who sit down at the grocery checkout instead of standing to serve them. Colleen Martin will be joining us from Cattle. So, Van, you just returned from Europe, land of the seated cashier. Uh, yeah. When you see cashiers sitting down, does it strike you as unusual or odd or do you have any feelings like do you do you what what are the feels for you when you when you see that? I I remember I, when I first saw it, I thought Wow, that's unusual. Like it just struck me as, wow, I've never seen anything like it. So we just wanted to, to dip into it a bit. Uh, I honestly, I have zero opinion on this issue. Yeah. I, I just, I just find it a fascinating debate. And yeah, you actually yeah. raised the point a few weeks ago, and I thought it was actually a very interesting question. But personally, like mm. me, I don't mm. care. Okay. I do not care. Yeah. Well, we'll hear more about that, and we'll hear what Canadians think. Actually, you uh, know what I would do yeah. if I were manager of a store? I would play musical chair. I would. No, run a song, mm. and then cashiers stop. Music stops. <laughs> they sit down. Here you go. That's your day right there. <laughs> yeah, right. Your, your life as an operator would be very short. Let me just put, put it to you that way. Exactly. Get that guy out of here. Now, a reminder to our listeners, this is uh, our last live You and Me episode, but we have a plethora of interviews that you and I did live in person at Seattle in Montreal uh, with some of the most interesting people in food and agriculture. Stay yep. tuned right through the summer, each and every Thursday, as usual. And then season five will kick off in late August, a little bit earlier than last year. We're, get, we're getting going a bit early. We've already started talking to people who are going to be on the pod. It's going to be a fantastic season. So yep. stay tuned in. And, Number and, five. Uh, wow. Number five. Yeah, our little I think we're going to have a new logo and new jingle, aren't we? We are We are working on some new stuff for sure. You oh, know? yeah. Like, uh, freshen are you going to shave your beard? I'm just no. throwing it out there. No, okay. no, no, no. It looks good even... on you. No. <laughs> well, thank you. All <laughs> right, well, let's get into the news. Let's uh, let's start where we must. Uh, William Shatner's profanity-laden commercial produced by Vancouver's uh, Ryan Reynolds uh, Digital Agency calling for the end to open pen salmon fishing on the coast. Let's uh, let's have a listen to a few excerpts from that uh, from that ad. I've received your orders. <laughs> That's right. That was uh, a few excerpts from the ad that, uh, that has been running on social media calling for the end of, and the government listened. So you've got an op-ed about this. This is not the first time we've uh, yeah. visited this. So we've had Isaiah Robertson uh, on, on the pod before. We've also had your colleague, uh, Stephanie Colombo, who's a global expert in aquaculture. We've had them both on the pod before, so I'll put a link into that. Uh, and we've talked about this issue because uh, there was kind of a moratorium, and then now the decision has come has come down. And you know, for whatever reason, the government does the crazy things they do. They make this announcement on a, a kind of an important day to Indigenous people, completely ignoring the fact that June twenty first. Yeah, um, I don't know. So context, and is and they actually made the announcement in Vancouver, not even close to communities, which was another uh, perceived you think, insult. You think they have comms? I, you'd think they have comms people 
advising them on stuff like this, but maybe they're maybe the work from home is settling in and they just don't have comms people anymore to say, you know, if we're going to make this decision, here's what I would do instead of doing what you're about to do. All right. So it's, an I, inter- I mean, typically, I mean, I, mm. I, I'm expecting good comms from the government to be honest, because they've been good at it. They've been mm. good at communications the last uh, several years. So I thought it was a huge miss, uh, yeah. unfortunate and surprising miss. Well, it's just divisive, right? In, in what is a fairly polarizing issue. Now, uh, to the audience, we did reach out, or you did reach out to the David Suzuki Foundation because yep. they were big advocates of this ban because we wanted to hear from, from them as well. Now, we didn't give them a lot of time. I mean, that was kind of last week. Uh, so hopefully we'll get someone well, on. Well, they didn't even respond. <laughs> well, uh, okay. Well, uh, if you <laughs> listen, David Suki. And, and so I, I was uh, I was a bit surprised that they didn't mm. respond. But, uh, I mean, it's one of those things. And, mm. and they probably, uh, they may have thought that we were setting up a trap for them. But no, it's not no. the case at all. Learn. We're, we're all no. for debates. No, no. Yeah. We're, we're all about that. I mean, you know, I, I think there's a couple of things. Let, let's touch on We've talked about it a little bit. But it, it feels to me. Like the industry, and tell me if you think I'm I'm close to the mark here, is paying for sins of the past. Like, you know, they have some horrifying pictures. That's a of, good way to put it. You know, very cloudy, poo-laden, lice-infested kind of pens from wherever there is. Uh, and, you know, talking to Isaiah and knowing what I know, talking to Stephanie, those things have yep. been rectified. They're much better than and, they used and coupled to be. with a very aggressive and effective strategy coming from environmental groups. I mean, they've been mm-hmm. very effective. And so when you see an actor like uh, William Schaffner and uh, another a beloved actor, along with another beloved actor, Ryan Reynolds, mm-hmm. who produces the video, that's when you know that really public opinion is, is, is against the industry. And, yeah. uh, and so that's a sign. And frankly, I, I think it will be an uphill battle for, for the industry. They still, there's still time, uh, cause there's still like this summer, which is why, uh, Isaiah and I mm. wrote the op-ed is to kind of say, listen, uh, you need to really consider many different things here. Mm-hmm. And you, you now you've met, you've made a decision, a populist one, I would say, but mm. it's important for the government to understand uh, I don't, you food know, security, I, environmental I, implications here. Because our studies, sure. yeah. the two studies that we published, mm. clearly shows that if you actually ban these uh, farms, you're going to basically import more salmon because there are two land-based farms right now in receivership in Canada. Actually, at least one is in receivership, Sustainable Blue in Nova Scotia right here. That's the Cadillac, the Cadillac of salmon farming i visited that facility it's incredible but they're under receivership because producing salmon on land is incredibly expensive and so the the business case to actually move all these pens on land is incredibly weak so that's why giving them five years is unreasonable Sorry. Well, it's, go it, ahead. It, it, no, no. I was just saying. I'm not sure it, it's a populist decision because if I if I read, there's a lot of opinion against them. And again, this may be a shadow of the past. But you know, it's it's um, I don't know. I, you know, there, there seems to be some. And this is why we wanted to get the David Suzuki Foundation or yeah. somebody to give us that alt alt case, knowing what we yep. know. Now, now there's so there's a bunch of things to take into consideration. Now, today, the economics are one thing. Tomorrow. Can you cast your mind forward both as an agri expert and an economist and say, okay, if everybody's got to produce inland, the price to consumers is going to go up and they won't have any other choices. Or we're grocers just import from another country who's yep. doing other practices. Because you could see if, if everybody is making the, the inland salmon at what – I mean you quoted some rates in the last episode that were significantly higher per kilo – but if everybody's doing it, it all goes up. But are, are you thinking that the grocers, without regulation preventing it, will just import farm salmon from well, Chile if you or you somewhere compare, else? If you, if you compare open pen salmon versus land base, uh, there's a difference of 40 to 60% retail. Okay, But my guess is that some of that salmon would go uh, for, to export markets. So you would import from Finland, you would import from Norway or... Uh, uh, Chile, for example. So the carbon footprint of some of these okay. products would would obviously increase. It's uh, according to our study, you would basically add anywhere between eight eighty thousand to one hundred fifty thousand cars in the economy, just because you're buying salmon from elsewhere, importing it, 
And of course, hmm. all depending of the Canadian dollar, what happens to the Canadian dollar, it may actually bring prices much higher. But the other issue, of course, uh, to Isaiah's point in our op-ed, I mean, it really is an opportunity for Indigenous communities to create jobs in rural in rural remote areas. And uh, so to me, it was really unfortunate that they've come up with this decision. But uh, at the end of the day, what's what's a little dishonest is to encourage open pen open pens to transfer to transition into land base. Why? And that land base option is if financially uh, no, is, is not financially viable. Well, I guess until the government steps in with huge subsidies, right? The government could subsidize it, but then that's just our tax dollars just being spent a different way, right? Yeah, exactly. And so uh, hmm. I, I don't know. I, I'm I'm a bit concerned, uh, to be honest. It's one uh, one other uh, decision that I think was uh, was uh, not properly thought through. Uh, but I think that Ottawa was, was severely influenced by yes, very really. well funded yep. um, environmentalist uh, environmentalist groups for sure. And did you see today, actually, in the news, uh, we, you sent me that link about the cod fishery situation in Newfoundland. Right. Yeah, Right. I was going to ask you about that. So on the I, other I got to tell you, I mean, again, timing is everything. And, uh, and when you actually look at some of the scientific data, um, the data still shows that inventories, cod inventories are still extremely historically low. You know, for the listeners, tell us what and was announced today so that it's the opening of cod fishing that was shut down 20 30 years ago off the yeah. newfoundland coast right that's what you're referring to yeah it was uh 32 years ago i believe uh so there was a moratorium and uh so that all ended and of course it was devastating for uh many newfoundland communities i remember uh, but now they're making an announcement uh, they're rebooting uh, uh the cod industry i guess in in a limited way it's we're not they're not just saying let's go out and and fish as much as possible because they did recognize that inventories are quite low but again I, I don't know if, it, if it's the right decision either. Uh, I you mm. kind of you're, you're forced to think this is this is political. This is about supporting. Yeah. This is about getting votes. Because uh, at the end of the day, from the scientific perspective, I'm not sure it makes a whole lot of sense. Well, what we could say is uh, this issue isn't over. I'd love to get uh, some uh, uh, if they're listening to this. Maybe they're not listening to this, but some opposing. I guess we call them opposing, or the the folks who are on the side of there's no good. Basically, they're saying there's no good way to raise salmon like this in open pens. That's uh, right. So I'd like I'd like to hear more about that. So um, yeah. let's hope we get somebody on for next season when we're back in the mic uh, in August. All right, let's um, let's move on. Let's talk about inflation data for May. So the numbers seem to be heating up. Inflation seems to be yeah. going higher. So we so on the, it was funny because there's two headlines in the paper today. One was you know uh, the bank of canada is saying i think we're going to we're actually going to stick this soft landing and the other then looking at the data which looks like inflation is still going which means we may not see another interest rate cut uh for the next month or until the fall or even later what do you what do you yeah, prognosticate well gdp gdp numbers are coming out next week so we'll know uh we'll know more about what the bank of canada will likely do uh in july at the end of July, uh, but my guess is that I mean yesterday's numbers were a little bit scary for the Bank mm. of Canada. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're back up again, so I mean from a food perspective, we're we're up to one point five, which is really the sweet spot. You want to be there, but when you actually look at industrial prices, I was actually quite surprised to see some industrial prices go up by as much as twenty percent, especially in the meat counter, uh, poultry, beef, veal, pork. Uh, chicken, all of these products have actually gone up in price. And when you say uh, industrial to, price, that's the so, whole what I, I what I call the wholesale price to grocers. That's right. What you're grocers to? are what what grocers are paying, and and frankly, I I, I wish media would give more would would, would bring more attention to those numbers because uh, I think a lot of Canadians do think that. Grocers just don't pay for the food that they sell. <laughs> right. It just shows and, up, in the and, back and the food magically appears on shelves. I mean, that's not how it works. I mean, you want to tell Canadians what's going on with grocers and how much they have to pay for their stuff uh, that they're selling to us. And you could see this is a bit concerning, to be honest, Michael. 
when you go when you look at wholesale prices, industrial prices, uh, there are several categories that are now on the rise month to month, not just year to year, month to month. Mm. And when I say eighteen to twenty percent, that's from April to May. Wow. Well, well yeah. I mean. I mean, it feels like, a, I mean, I know there's some commodities like cocoa and olive oil that are being, that are just 400% higher, just yeah. based on climate events and disease Well, vegetable and oil has calmed down actually in the last okay. two months, Yeah, but they're still very high. I mean, obviously, but there are, there are signs that perhaps uh, we could see prices rise. So we saw a dip earlier than expected, so in April, uh, March, mm-hmm. April, mm-hmm. Uh, May, we're st- seeing an upswing. The other good news for grocers is that food sales are on the rise again. They actually increase. Mm. So food retail data came out last week. Food sales are up 1.7% month to month, uh, which is really welcome news for retailers. Is, is that inflation adjusted or is that... That's when adjusted. They, that's right. That's, yeah. uh, so that takes into account inflation. That's a true growth, in other words. Yeah. So that's okay. good news for grocers because it's hard to actually make money when uh, when the market stagnates. Uh, but it, it appears as though the pie has starting to uh, it, to grow again. So GDP numbers, I think, next week are critical, and we'll see what happens uh, for the month of July. Let's talk about, uh, you've got a project on the go with uh, MNP on designing a global agri-food power index. And I, I you know, I'm, I'm very interested to learn more about these indexes because I, there's a, a magazine I read, Monocle magazine, that does a soft power index. And, you know, I do worry about Canada's place in the world in many, many things. I think it's coming to the surface over and over again. You know, they're, you know, we could get kicked out of the G7 any day. I mean, our, our lack of payment, the 2% to GDP for NATO, for NATO. example, is, yeah, you know we're about to we're about to enter into negotiations with the U.S. in terms of uh, the free trade agreement, and there's a whole bunch of things that we need to be on side with. I mean, you know, that's a 14 billion dollar ticket that it's tough to run win an election promoting yeah. that. Though I could see us spending all that money in the Arctic to protect our sovereignty in the all Arctic. Right, by anyway. the way, by the way, you didn't see this, but. Um, Canada is now the second largest buyer of food products coming from the U.S., surpassing China. So number one is Mexico. Number two is Canada. Number three Mm. is China. Now, China is not buying as much, which is Mm -hmm. why China Mm -hmm. went from number one to number three. But now we're number two, So, which means that we're, we're heavily reliant on the U.S. to feed ourselves, basically. And so is that a good thing? I'm not sure. Uh, dependency is never a good thing when, especially when it comes to politics. And so that's closer. So that's one thing that uh, concerns me. And I agree with you. I, I, I am concerned about Canada's place in the world, but this index, and this is really, it's a discussion I've had with MNP for a while. And, uh, we came to an agreement about six months ago to set up this, uh, global index to look at how nations are influential around the world. Mm. And I thought it was a neat idea. Yeah. Uh, and, and the idea didn't come from me. The idea actually came from my team. And who is, sorry, who is M- MNP? MNP is the largest consulting firm uh, in the agri-food space in Canada. So it's not the largest consulting firm. It's not part of the big four. Mm. But in agri-food, that's the one. Okay. So MNP would, would, would sponsor basically everything like Cial, for example. Uh, any event you go to, MNP is there for sure. And, and so, so talk about this power index. What are you, you going to be releasing so it basically, this fall? So we're trying to agree on a series of metrics to measure uh, the influence of different nations around the world. And so we look at sustainability, we look at exports, we look at imports, we look at labor, we look at uh, R&D, uh, we look at all sorts of things. We look at consumer trust as well, uh, the ability of a nation to feed itself and, uh, and how that nation is actually maintaining, managing relationships with other nations around the world, not just in uh, on one continent, but around the world. And so it's a fascinating exercise. And so my hope is to release the study sometime in the fall. Fantastic. Well, we'll get on the mic and uh, we'll talk all about it. That's fantastic. Absolutely. All right. Well, let's take a quick break now. Let's hear from uh, about our fascinating study with Colleen Martin from Cattle. 
Colleen, welcome back to the Food Professor podcast. How are you? Hello, hello. I'm doing great. Thank you, Hey, guys. Colleen. So, uh, so Van and I had this, both of us were in Europe uh, this past, in, within the past couple of weeks, and we had the same observation, and we were asking, you know, what amazing things can we find out from, from cattle and, and Canadians? And one of the things that has always struck me is unusual, it struck me as very unusual the first time I saw it, was cashiers in grocery stores sitting down. When I first most, saw it, most was, of them, most of them. Well, not, not, yeah, not all, not, not I've everyone. never seen that, to be honest, guys. Never in seen Europe? It. In Europe? Wow. Well, you're rubbing it in. I was not in Europe while you were making these <laughs> observations, and I've never seen anyone sitting in Canada. No, right. in Canada, very, never that's, that's Canada. exactly why we had in this fact, debate, Michael and I. Yeah. I was in university, and a part-time job of mine was being a cashier at a Food Basics. And in fact, when I wanted to sit and, you know, take some pressure off the old knees, I was uh, encouraged not to. You, really? You almost encouraged said reprimanded. Encouraged or forced to? Yeah, you well, almost you know, said reprimanded but, or yeah, reminded. Pretty much. Yeah. yeah. So, so that got us thinking because that's yep. kind of intriguing to me. So on the sense of things, um, you know, if you've got an older if, – if it's harder to find associates, if maybe some of your associates aren't young teenagers who can stand forever at a Taylor Swift concert, um, wouldn't – you know, other than like accommodations as the <laughs> technical term would be, what's up with – why don't we have more cashiers sitting down? Wouldn't that, in, you know, grow the pool of people who could do the job for longer and, and be more comfortable? Our going in hypothesis was that Canadians would view, I guess North Americans, uh, Canadians particularly, would view cashiers sitting down as somehow less engaged or lazy or, I don't know, some, that, some, that, something That is pejorative. your hypothesis, by the way, Michael, not our hypothesis. <laughs> what was your hypothesis? <laughs> Levan, what was your hypothesis? Going I actually had no, I had no opinion. I, I just thought it was more about uh, comfort for the the employee. I mean, mm-hmm. whether you, you, giving a choice uh, to to employees whether or not to sit down. I, and I, and frankly, you've thought about this, Michael. I've never really thought about this until you ask. And I thought, well, if people want to sit down as a cashier in Canada, they, they just sit down. That's it. And but but to your point, Michael, I think but they uh, don't. culturally. And from a customer service perspective, uh, I and and frankly, with Colleen's experience, I mm-hmm. guess it is sort of enforced as a non-written policy affecting the entire industry. So we wanted to look into it. So Colleen, we asked a bunch. We asked you to ask a bunch of people. So take us through how many people you talked to. I think it was close to ten thousand. Uh, so mm-hmm. it, this is, to say the least, a great sample. And. Let's start. Yeah. Tell us. And I uh, guess they were all sitting down. <laughs> they may have been. <laughs> on that mobile device of yours. They could have been anywhere. It could have been on the subway. The way That's they answered, right. fantastic. That's true. Exactly. So, t- so take us through at a high level. Um, you know, what's the end? What's the population of people answered? And then start taking us through the results of our survey and the questions. Will do. First of all, I want to fact check you on that Taylor Swift comment. That is full zone two. What those ladies are doing in that audience. They are not standing. They are jumping and running on the spot. They are getting. 180 minus their age, heartbeat going. I love to see it. And that's a comment coming from a triathlete, by the way. That's so. true. Zone two. Everyone knows what zone two is these days. Everyone knows Peter Atia and the Outlive book. If they don't, look it up. Um, so we did ask. I was very fascinated with this topic because of my experience as a cashier. We asked 9,243 people last week while you guys were ripping it up in Europe and the first question we asked was, how frequently do you shop at the grocery stores? Just to understand, you know, how often people are, are seeing cashiers. And we saw, we saw overwhelmingly that 72.8% of Canadians are in the stores weekly, 10% daily, which is high, in my opinion, and mm-hmm. like what I thought was going in. And then 10, another 10% every couple or a few weeks. So lots, um, of, well, lots of people and lots of opportunity yeah. to observe and interact. This isn't, a, yeah. this isn't a rare occasion by any stretch. So. Yeah. Yeah, that validates. But with that it. said, when you're in there, are you really looking at what the mm. cashiers are doing? I'm not. I don't know. Maybe I'm just on a mission to get out of there without being rear-ended with a cart mm. and then, you know, a kid screaming at me or something. You don't talk a bit to of them, Colleen? There's a bit of self-serve there, too. You never talk to them? <laughs> I, I don't. You know what? This is another thing that's going to label me. I don't use – I use the self-checkout because <laughs> it's faster because – only because I'm really fast at it because I used to do it for a living and I am <laughs> faster than the cashiers because I'm okay, very so efficient. Se- separate <laughs> note to all the grocers listening. If you want more engagement on uh, on self-checkout, train the customers to be 
like cashiers per day. Oh, right? don't even get don't even get our our the Canadians started on that topic because they already think they should be getting paid or a discount for doing their own checkout. That is a resounding. We've had other other um, um, studies in field that that people say it's not fair, but here we go. Have you ever noticed if cashiers are sitting or standing in grocery stores? What do you think, guys? In terms of yes, where do you think it is? Notice uh, noticing, uh, I guess fifty uh, percent, maybe seventy six point eight percent of people have noticed mm. whether cashiers are sitting or standing. It's and fifteen percent, fifteen percent said they haven't, and then only seven point five percent say I'm not sure, and that seems low to me. I thought the majority would would say I don't notice, but clearly people are on the lookout. They are noticing, yeah, absolutely, yeah. for what's happening there. And there's that stigma attached to you know standing versus sitting, laziness, and professionalism, all that kind of stuff, right? No, so that's the hypothesis. We, that's the, that's, that's the what hypothesis. we're trying to get to. That's what we're trying to right. get to. We don't know if that's the case, but so we're going to dig into this a little more. Yeah. And we asked, how would you feel if cashiers in in Canadian grocery stores were sitting down? instead of standing at the register. On a national level, 28.6% of people said that's a very positive thing. 15.9% okay. said somewhat positive. So top two box, that's, top two box, that's pretty good. Mm -hmm. And then 46% neutral. Mm -hmm. And the balance of that around 8.5% eight, eight were negative. Negative. So that's pretty low. It's, it's, I thought that it would be much more skewed. People would view that negatively. Negatively. Well, to, to mm. neutral to positive, which is kind of mm -hmm. sometimes the way I look at your research, you know, this is something that could be good if it, if it worked. Like Canadians don't seem to mind. Interesting. But the, the, neutral, the neutral result is uh, concerning, though. I mean, it's, mm. it's a, that's a dangerous zone to be in because <laughs> you never know where it could go, and that's almost half of respondents. And so if you are, if uh, people do notice and all of a sudden you go the wrong way mm -hmm. with your policy, mm -hmm. your store policy, you may basically annoy some consumers. And, and it's a pretty direct kind question, of though, Sylvain. Isn't it? Like, it's a pretty direct question. Like, it's not I know, a... but the, I, I just hate indifference. I just, <laughs> as a researcher, I hate, just have an yeah. opinion, for yeah. goodness sake. <laughs> Are you for so... or against? Come on. <laughs> People love, you know, go look at Instagram. You'll see lots of opinions there. Yeah. So oh, yeah. you broke this out by gender and by demographic. So essentially millennials and Gen Y over index and positive support for sitting. So that, that tracks, right? And in terms of women and men, um, there was really no difference in terms of neutrality or positivity. So it was okay. more a generational difference um, of, of the younger generation supporting people having um, a more, oh, I guess, okay. uh, a better workplace, essentially, is right. the assumption, if you're okay. able to sit. So then we asked, uh, what is your level of agreement with the following statement? Grocery store cashiers sitting at the register appear less professional versus cashiers who are standing. So nationally, top two box agree, 31% is less professional. So we're kind of double positive Ooh, here. So it's a third. Yep. A third of people think it's less professional and 36% neutral. Here's your favorite. They're neutral again. And then 32%. So more people disagree with that just marginally and not statistically significant when you look in the say. margin of error. So the centrally is the same. So it's for it, for and against. It's a tie basically with a group in the center that would probably have, I, it's so bad. It feels like, they, people would have to actually see it. But the questions are pretty direct. I mean, we're not beating around the bush. Yeah, right? but with a result like that, if I'm a manager of a store and I see a result like that, status quo, mm -hmm. man. Yeah, but I if just, I, would, I... I wouldn't do anything. I, I wouldn't change a, a thing. I'll give, you, I'll give you another approach. The other approach would be take a store and try it. Pilot. What are the KPIs you know I, for you success? Know what I saw in Spain uh, mm -hmm. last week. I saw... So I walked into a little... And they were four cashiers. Two of them were sitting. Two of, the, two of them were standing. Mm -hmm. The two youngest cashiers were sitting. The two oldest, and they were probably at least 55 years old, both of them were standing. I thought well, was, that was interesting. Well, mm. it, and, and Colleen, you asked what the KPIs were. I think, there's, I think there's three sets of them, right? There's obviously the consumer set. You'd have to do a pre-post in some way, shape, or form of those people it'd be a little tricky but it's not like uh, i don't know I, I mean it's not like you'd buy less would you not exactly. shop there would you not shop there because you you thought these people you're not getting great value like we'd have to scratch the surface a lot deeper but 
I would think the other set of KPIs would be on employees and associates. And then the third set mm-hmm. would be on, on throughput and productivity, mm-hmm. right? Hours, like, are your people happier, more mm-hmm. satisfied? And C, are they doing more work for longer because they don't have to like, you know, stretch and take breaks, more breaks just for mm-hmm. bending and sitting. Like those, those to me would be the three, the first one would be the toughest to get at, I guess. What do you think, Sylvain? Yeah, no, I agree. Uh, you, you need to be specific here in terms of what could, uh, you know, what could drive a, a change, I guess. Um, yeah. I, I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, with a result like that, uh, you, you don't want to rock the boat. You can try things you know, over a week or two weeks, like you mentioned, uh, Michael, just using one store or high going hybrid. Uh, but I mean, one would think if you want to encourage people to use self checkout, wouldn't you want to make cashiers less? Uh, look less professional, I guess. I don't know. Oh, that's like, a dark interpretation. Like, why? Why not? I mean, if you if your strategy is to push people to use self checkouts, wouldn't you want to make <laughs> cashiers less attractive? Like, less of an attractive so, option. So your your advice is to make cashiers. Your advice look lazy. Is to make cashiers <laughs> unapproachable. So I, I, I mean, guys, I mean, the I bottom know. from my experience as a consumer. I mean, often uh, the the only uh, unpleasant quote unquote experiences I've seen are, are young kids just shy to death. and don't want to even look at you in the eye though. Beyond that, it's been okay. I mean, but really, uh, as a manager, you want, you want to train your cashiers to be engaging, looking people in the eye. I mean, I've, I've seen several cashiers never even looking at me. They just look at my credit card. <laughs> okay. And, and what else? What else we got in the survey, Colleen? The mic kind of. So I think uh, one of the in, uh, really interesting bits about question four is that I broke it out by gender. So thirty six percent of women disagree, meaning uh, they appear less professional versus cashiers who are standing, and twenty seven percent of men disagree. Oh, it's so judgmental. Most cashiers are but women. But that's statistically significant. Yeah, right that is, it is. And most cashiers are women. They're judging their peers. Mm, mm, oh. mm. So we got one last question. We asked then, what is your level of agreement with the following statement? Grocery store cashiers sitting at the register are likely to provide slower service because that's what matters, right? CX of the consumer versus cashiers who are standing. So for Q5 nationally, Top two box agree, thirty seven percent. So there's more more people agreeing, and less people neutral, thirty one percent, and thirty three percent disagree in the bottom two box. So there's virtu- and there's virtually no difference in gender. I was I was expecting uh, like clearer results. To be honest, it's it seems to be a split market. What do you think, Michael? I'm I'm wondering, and and this is where the research professionals come in. I mean. Is, is it a question that people hadn't considered until we asked it in the survey? Like, it's, it's, it's not a question that, like, it's not an active debate in any kind of form, in any way, shape, or form. I guess if you've traveled in, to Europe and seen it once or twice, but do you think there's any response bias in this? Like, oh, I didn't even think of that. And that kind of creates that big middle ground of, I don't know. I don't know what to think. Let's say, let's say you're a reporter and you actually ask people outside a grocery store and ask the same question to them face to face. My guess is that 90% would say, let them sit that they want to. But the survey to me is telling. (laughs) I think the the survey conducted by Carol gets to the truth, gets to the Mm. bottom of what people actually think. Interesting. Super interesting. It's split. Right. In thirds. Right. I think people I I had to ask myself the same question. I don't really care. I, I care on the about the experience I get. If sure. I were to go to a cashier, are they happy? Are they nice? Is it fast? Those are the only things I care about. And if giving them the flexibility to sit versus standing will make them better at their job, happier, and pr- providing a better CX to the consumer, then let them sit. <laughs> but I, I'm surprised with uh, with with COVID and everything, everything that's gone on the last four years. I'm surprised that we haven't we haven't had this discussion about cashiers. I mean, uh, remember the mm-hmm. hero pay and and they mm-hmm. were considered as heroes, and uh, nobody really talked about their working conditions beyond the virus, beyond being exposed to mm-hmm. risks. 
uh, it was all about the job. It was about risks, but it was nothing. It, w- it wasn't about comfort. It wasn't about uh, mm. their roles and and different tasks they have to they have to do. And so I, I think this is the, I think this debate is not going to go away. I think it's actually going to stick around for a while. It's unfinished business, I think. Well. Listen, Colleen, this is exactly what we were hoping to do uh, with our partnership is just kind of get below the surface of some interesting ideas that we had. So uh, do you have any plans for the summer? We're going to get you back on when we're back on live together uh, in August, early September. What are you doing for the summer? Uh, training for more races. Mm-hmm. That's yes. my boring life. And What's we do your, operate. Race? race? My race, next race is in the Niagara area called Barrelman. It's a half Ironman distance triathlon. So that'll be mid-September. Mid-September. Before, okay. before then, we operate a pick-your-own organic blueberry farm in oh. Flamborough area in Cooktown. And so we're prepping for that. And that uh, that goes from mid-July to mid-August. So mid-August. we're excited about uh, inviting hundreds of people to the farm to yeah. pick their own blueberries. And where, oh, and where can people go? I love, I love picking blueberries. Nope. You'll, have to down, you'll have to delegate that to your children. But uh, <laughs> yes. you can have some pizza. I'll fire up the pizza oven if you guys come out. Well, uh, tell the listeners, in case they happen to be in the uh, greater Toronto area or Milton or Flamborough, that whole area, where to find more uh, information about so your So how far program. away are you from Toronto, Colleen? A bit, depending on where in Toronto, but downtown about an hour and 10. So, very you know, not, close. not very, not very far. And if they want information on Facebook, Binkley farm, B I N K L E Y farm is where Binkley you can find farm. us. What a, what a multidimensional personality and talent you are. My goodness. <laughs> it's, it's an undiagnosed <laughs> ADHD, but thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, thanks again for joining us on the pod. Uh, thank great, you. Uh, yeah, uh, thanks great. for your partnership and thanks for, for cattle for, uh, for helping us do, what we do and bring what we do to people uh, have an amazing summer. We'll be in touch because we already well. have some ideas about what we want to ask Canadians Exciting. through cattle for the fall. We'll be in touch. And uh, until then take care. And uh, I'm coming up for some blueberries. Uh, you've been uh, quite articulate uh, or you've put a fair bit of volume into, <laughs> into this. Your thought, you're thinking about the capital gains showdown. Yep. Now, you call it a showdown. I'm not sure it's a showdown at all. I mean, uh, you know, basically... No, it's it was, not a showdown, no. It, it, it was a trap or attempted trap laid for Polyev, and he just punted. He just said, well, you know, I'll look at it, uh, but he has no opinion on it. Now, there's a lot of people coming out saying it doesn't just affect, what is it, 1.1% of people. Uh, what are your thoughts in terms of agriculture? You're worried about the I want the to give a shout out to uh, Andrew Chang from the CBC. I actually think that he actually... Uh, prepared a 15-minute video explaining why this new, uh, this increase in, uh, in capital gains tax is not just impacting the ultra-rich. Uh, and he goes through 15 minutes, he basically just uh, unpacks everything very, very well. Uh, okay. for, and then he starts, he starts to look at... Um, generational uh, management uh, or succession management between generations. Uh, He looks at different professions like doctors and farmers, how they can be impacted as well in this video. Um, I mean, most capital, I I mean, I'm sure you've paid capital gains taxes. I've done that too. And I mean, it happens in life, but it's always a one time. So, um, Every year, you'll you'll have a lot of Canadians pay uh, mm. capital gains taxes, um, but they're not necessarily the same Canadians every single year. But over time, you may actually end up seeing well over a million Canadians being impacted by this. Jack Mintz, former professor of mine. I didn't know that. That's right. Jack was uh, my economics professor at uh, Rotman. Good guy. I know Jack well. He's wow, been on no, the, he's, he's, been he's on a great guy. Podcast. So I've, I've 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 interacted with him many times. So he's the he's a, an economist at the University of Calgary, and yeah. he basically uh, uh, tried to calculate. Economist. He's probably one of the world's foremost tax economists, right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And so basically, he claimed uh, in Andrew's video that approximately 1.2 to 1.3 million Canadians will be impacted by this change. And I agree with them. I actually think over time, you just think of the number of farms, the number of businesses, the number, Mm. and and 
frankly, it's it's all about planning. And uh, in, in the agri-food sector in particular, and this is something I said uh, in Parliament a few weeks ago, we got to be careful because many, many businesses are family businesses, and that's their pension plan. And so you want to uh, understand how these taxes, how the fiscal regime in Canada can impact uh, one's ability to transfer assets to another generation, or how can they use their assets? And they're often, I mean, these family businesses are asset rich, cash poor. We've heard that before. And how do you actually make sure that these, that families are well protected? And, and that's why I think there's a huge debate. But there's a lot of misinformation on, coming from both ends, I think, uh, from Pierre Poiliev and uh, Christian Freeland. But again, I, I do want to encourage people, and you should put a link uh, on our show I'll with uh, with Andrew Chang's uh, video from the CBC, because I think in 15 minutes, if you're confused about the capital gains tax debate, listen to that video. It will clarify everything. Well, not a political podcast, but it, it may be all a moot point, because based on uh, the results, I don't know if you're following the by-election in Toronto-St. Paul, where the... Uh, Liberals lost uh, an ironclad stronghold, which yep. um, kind of lays, you know, Trudeau had said, uh, our prime minister had said, you know, Canadians really aren't in decision mode yet, so I'm not worried. I think they're in decision mode now, at least the voters in, Tor- <laughs> in, in Toronto, St. Paul, uh, electing a conservative. So I'm not sure uh, what that means. Uh, you know, often these by-elections are a, a, a message to the ruling power. I'm not sure that liberals, it's very hard to see the liberals being in power. I got two two messages there. Okay. okay. One, I don't think that Trudeau would want to go before November mm-hmm. to understand who is going to be the new tenant or old tenant or mm-hmm. are we going to see the same tenant in a White House or a new tenant mm-hmm. in a White House. That's one thing. And it is going to be influencing Canadian politics, I think. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's one thing. Interesting. And, and secondly, I would never, ever ever underestimate a Trudeau, mm. ever. Uh, and I know that polls are against him right now. He just lost a Voters very, are against him. It's not just the polls anymore. It's not just opinion. It's, <laughs> he got I drowned. know, and he just lost a, 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 a big uh, part, but it, it was a partial election. And, and we're about to, start to, about to start the summer. Mid, yeah. Mid-July, everyone would have forgotten about Tor- Tor- Toronto-St. Paul's. Like everyone will forget about politics. And so we're going mm. into the fall. Mm. The presidential election will be in full swing. Mm. Interesting. I honestly, if I were Trudeau, uh, I, I wouldn't move at all. And frankly, if I, if I were a conservative, I wouldn't want Trudeau to leave. Anyway. That, I, I mean, I, the liberals had a star candidate and the conservatives didn't and they won. And so that's a really telling story. But again... Like I said, politics, like two months is a is an eternity in politics. And and like I said, oh. Trudeau, he, I wouldn't I wouldn't underestimate him. Like I, I just he can come back. I think he can come back, depending on what goes on in the United States and everything else. Inflation Not is going nothing. away. I think you're completely wrong. The they the liberals cannot win the election with Trudeau in and sixteen they won't, months. They won't. It's too late. Sixteen months. The polls. If you look at the polls, they're so far apart. Whatever you say about the I know, polls. but the cost of living crisis is coming to an end. Ah, anyway. And there's nobody to replace <laughs> him. Like all the usual cast of characters, including Mark Carney, who's just will be seen as, you know, that's what's his name, version 2.0. Yeah. What's his name? Michael Ignati of 2.0. Yeah. Anyway, not a political podcast, but it does affect agriculture. But it's, it's so, a bit of fun. It's, a, it's kind it, of fun. It, it's a bit of fun. <laughs> Speaking of a bit of fun, but actually very interesting, let's get to our interview, our second interview uh, with Victor Thomas from uh, Canada India Business Council, because there's some politics involved in this, right? Uh, there's oh, a lot yeah. of politics involved in, and he refers to it. He's not shy about uh, mentioning the relations between India and Canada are under uh, a cloud, to say the least. Uh, yeah. But he explains it better and he explains why we should care. Let's have a listen. Well, today, uh, joining us on our podcast, we have a special guest, uh, in fact, someone who I've, I've known for many, many, many years, uh, going back to my days in, in Regina. Now, uh, he's traveling all over the world. I'm traveling, too. Once in a while, we run into each other at, at some airport somewhere, uh, and I'm talking about Victor Thomas, the CEO of, of the Canadian India Business Council. Victor, welcome to our podcast. 
Hey, Savan, nice to uh, nice to connect with you. Nice to connect with you, Michael, and uh, great yeah. privilege to be here. So, so first of all, t- talk to us a little bit about yourself, uh, who you are, and how do you end up uh, working um, for the Cane India Business Council? Sure, thank you. Well, as you mentioned, I was uh, born and raised in beautiful Regina, Saskatchewan. You know, that part of the world happens to export a lot to the rest of the world, actually disproportionately such that uh, it, you know, got that international, I would say even an international trade bug in me. And as I look at back at my career over the last two decades, my focus has been in, on international strategy, uh, governance, and global business development. And when you look at where the world is moving, it happens to be to a country that's always been around, but now happens to to hold the torch as the largest growth economy in the world. And so when I was fortunate to um, have an opportunity to take the leadership at the council uh, now close to four and a half years ago, I thought uh, pretty pretty unique timing and pretty unique place for India. And if Canada can do more with a country like that, uh, that's pretty exciting. So that's kind of why I'm here. And we're here to increase trade, increase investment bi-nationally between the two countries. And um, we think there's a lot of complementarity. And when it comes to agriculture, a uh, pretty special relationship. Yeah, no, absolutely. Now, we've we've heard, of course, following the news that uh, uh, the relationship between Canada and India is uh, somewhat tense right now. But from an agri-food perspective, how would you describe uh, Canada's relationship currently right now with India? So yes, there are some um, tensions on the diplomatic front. But one of the few things that I've got both countries to agree upon uh, the last eight months is that business should continue. And business has continued. And when you look at the total value of trade and goods um, you know, the relationship's about a 10 to $13, $13 billion relationship um, in actual goods and then a, about a $10 billion uh, service relationship. You know, that we've actually seen numbers increase. And, mm. and so that's, you know, very few people have expected that. Very few people actually thought that's the case. Uh, I, of course, would like to see it increase a lot more than it has. But in the midst of these diplomatic challenges, uh, business is finding a way and business is finding the markets, um, again, binationally, not just from Canada to India, but also from India to Canada. And we're seeing that because when you think of what India is, it is now the most populous nation on earth. When you think of the growth that is projected uh, 8%, we just saw an election last week where you saw a historic win by the current prime minister for a third um, mandate. Uh, this one uh, just under a majority, but with this coalition, he'll have a majority. You're starting to see India's trajectory uh, at a scope and scale that you've never seen it in its previous um, number of decades. And you're starting to see uh, business engage with that market, uh, unlike you've ever seen it before. And so just to give you context, now it's the most populous nation on earth. Uh, there's a lot of mouths to feed. So when you talk about agriculture, uh, Canada is the fifth largest export in the world. India is, is the most populous nation. Um, they cannot produce enough food for themselves. So when you're looking for safe, reliable, high-quality food, Canada can fill in. And yes, there is competition in the world. So if we don't do it, we're not going to be positioned. But Canada should and can um, be you know, a safe, reliable um, supplier of highest grade food in the world to India. And when you think of a, a nation that is not just um, large in terms of mouths to feed, but also happens to be, be vegetarian, we can also produce yeah. we can also produce and supply high quality protein food to that emerging market. That's great. So I guess uh, from uh, you, you seem to be very positive about uh, about our relationship. Uh, with India uh, going two ways. So what are some of the greatest opportunities uh, still uh, st- sticking to, to food and, and ag? What are the greatest opportunities for both uh, Canadian and Indian businesses uh, when it comes to, to uh, this particular relationship? 
Well, I think I think I, I take a, a macro, more macro picture um, than some that want to get into the, the nuances of current diplomatic challenges. And when we actually see the numbers, as I said, numbers are going up in terms of trade. So that's great. But, uh, you know, if you even look at the Indo-Pacific strategy that the government put out in late November of 2022, um, agri-food is a priority sector. And so if you think of the Indo-Pacific strategy, uh, our bias is the heart of the Indo-Pacific strategy comes through India. And they've even talked about putting, you know, upwards of $32 million in terms of expanding that ag agricultural trade with the region. And agri-trade is, is booming because basically what you're seeing is the economic development of India. But India, unlike Canada, is not an export-driven economy. It's a consumer-driven economy. And you're seeing um, some of the poorest of the poor uh, move up the socioeconomic ranks. And you're seeing a middle class that is approximately two to 300 million um, scheduled to rise to 600 to 800 to even possibly a billion people um, over the decade, next two decades. And so as you start to see that, what, what do people want as they move up the socioeconomic um, ladder is they want high quality food and India can only provide so much. And so that's why you're starting to see places like Saskatchewan, which you referenced earlier, uh, since 2013, mm -hmm. exports have grown from India, um, from Saskatchewan alone to India, 52%. And so, wow. you know, things like lentils, things like pulse crops, uh, even potentially canola, all these things are going to be needed in a country that's going to be on the trajectory it is. Well, with 52% growth, uh, you know, my next question was going to be, maybe it's, I don't know, maybe it's redundant, but what are, are there any regulatory challenges that Canadian agri-food companies face when exporting to India? There are, and there can be um, regulatory challenges. And again, I think that's one of the positives in the midst of a diplomatic, diplomatic tensions. We're actually seeing um, no extra barriers or regulatory retaliation mm. from both governments. But, mm. you know, India typically has had, and that's been one of the challenges, is that as the market becomes more mature, um, you're actually seeing them get trade agreements with other countries around the world. Australia now has one. UAE, mm -hmm. uh, they did a four-country uh, block uh, trade agreement worth $100 billion, uh, in the last six months. And so, and, and Canada up until uh, September last year was looking to an early progress agreement. And so it is significant because you're starting to see India engage with the world, unlike it's ever done before. And you're starting to see the world engage with India. Uh, if you think about it, just 11, 12 years ago, India was the 11th largest economy in the world, and the UK was the fifth. In mm. the fall of 2022, uh, India has surpassed the UK now to become the fifth largest economy. And if you look at the track that it's on, uh, you know, potentially by the end of this decade, it will not just be the fourth, but it'll move up to third largest economy in the world. And so mm -hmm. you're starting to see them in terms of um, the maturing of the market, in terms of understanding the the growth that the country's having as a whole but again end of the day it's because of that large population base and sure. they're going to need higher quality better quality foods and rich proteins and um you know we're we're our hands up to say canada can provide more of that now is is there anything let me ask the question differently is there anything sure standing in uh, the way from how we produce food so there's trade agreements let's call those um, you know, those are negotiated trade agreements. Is there anything or advice, so to speak, uh, that is getting in or could get in our way in the way we make food or register it or food safety? Is there anything structurally that might get in the way? Well, I think, you know, the nice thing about Canada is we export to, we export right around the world and our cytosanitary standards are extremely high. Uh, if you want to, if you want to find reasons to, impede uh, trade with Canada um, on a number of different levels. You can always find things. You can always put in tariffs. You can always um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. find reasons, right? Especially when you think of, of how politically charged a country like India has at the national level and at the subnational level. If, for example, um, you know, prices 
for or example, um, local farmers had really great crops. And so often there'd be, you know, if monsoons were good, there was a lot of water. Farmers had really good crops, wanted to keep prices high. Sometimes you'd see tariffs immediately go up mm. on agricultural mm. products. But again, when you look at it and take a macro look and you look at the actual demand that India is going to have, you are seeing less and less of those things come into place. And yes, there'll be some ebbs and flows, but the overall macro showcases the the need and the growth opportunity. And we're starting to see more and more collaboration with Canadian uh, agricultural providers to um, provide this market. Now, within all this excitement, what do you, what do you, what do you, what does your organization do? Sounds like you spend a lot of time on an airplane back and forth. Uh, and you know, you know, our country well, what, what, uh, what, what are your top files in terms of addressing regulatory and challenges or regulatory opportunities and smoothing and facilitating smoother trade? So, you know, we are, we are, you know, that um, we like to be the linchpin in the economic corridor. So how do we actually increase uh, investment financially? How do we increase trade? Uh, you know, we have an advisory council. We have two of the most influential agricultural CEOs on that advisory. Uh, we bring companies together, not just in India, but also in Canada. And mm-hmm. we're always in dialogue to say, you know, what's happening? Um, are deals being done? Where are the challenges? Where are the where are the pain points? And where are those opportunities? And wherever we can help um, connect those mm-hmm. folks and those leaders, we're there to do it. And sometimes, um, and if we can get out of the way and let everyone just see deals get done, then we're happy to just right. um, see those things move. So, uh, right. the council has been around forty two years. I think the next ten years of the council will be the most exciting, right. uh, given all the things that I, I've said. But it's. Uh, there has been there has been challenges in the economic relationship because of the diplomatic and diplomatic aside yep. the the upside is uh, so significant that you know i'm i'm still uh, cautiously very optimistic all right um you know let's talk about any cultural differences uh, you know world's largest democracy just had an election what a mammoth election just i just my my mind spins in terms of running an election that size but um you know we have that together and and we have many other things together anything that that uh, you off uh, that you find that um you need to smooth out or gets in the way in terms of cultural the way we do business together or the way each country does business differently any 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 of those things the soft challenges can we say as you mentioned, you just had a historic election. 642 million people voted uh, over six weeks. And, um, you know, <laughs> from crazy. all accounts, no yeah. one's uh, opposition government, no one's pointed a finger with any errors. So think of a logistical yeah. quagmire that they just um, went through and, yeah, yeah. and on all accounts was very successful. The current government, as I mentioned, didn't get their full majority and yet mm-hmm. uh, are finding a way to navigate but one of the biggest cultural differences in terms of business is India is a very cost sensitive market. And that is, mm. that is embedded into the fabric of the people and of the companies. And so that is always going to play a major piece. And when I, t- when I mentioned um, competition, you know, Australia has, has made a significant pivot towards India. In the last number of years, they, as I mentioned, they got a trade agreement, but now two different governments, two different stripes have, um, you know, and part of part of their courting of India has been due to some other geopolitical, you know, frustrations they've had uh, in mm-hmm. the region, specifically with um, China. And yeah. so you're seeing you're seeing markets like that. You see the geopolitical uh, disruptions that are taking place in with Russia and Ukraine. Uh, that's also impacting India. But again, India is looking at things that are cost sensitive and price will always be a big dictator. The other thing Mm -hmm. to understand is that the market is diverse and fragmented. So if you look at some people just think of India as, as a country that's unified and yes, it is a country and it is unified, but the diversity within the country. So if you compare it to a place like the EU, India would actually in many ways would be more diversified than the EU would be if you go to the state-to-state level uh, right throughout the country. So food, dress, language, all are different. 
um, throughout. And so it, it, it can be a hard market to try to get your head around if you're actually dealing with all of those different areas. And, and I think, you know, all the more reason given some of the diplomatic challenges, Agri Canadian egg food companies have to focus on establishing credibility and partnerships with local firms and actively engage in those communities because as you both know, agriculture is always local. And unless you um, understand the local, then it's actually hard to do things at scale. And I think our companies that have, um, that have been there for a while have done it well, have engaged and have those relationships, but it's not easy just to swoop in, uh, come with the best price and uh, immediately get traction. High context culture, have to know you, who you're dealing with, have to know the families, have to know the businesses, and uh, then you can move quickly. At this point, uh, let's pivot a little bit uh, towards policy, uh, sure. and uh, we're going to allow you to to uh, to vent <laughs> uh, based on your frustrations with uh, both governments. Uh, every government tend to uh, to see trades um, very differently, and so what are some of the pet peeves that you would have, uh, whether it's regarding Canada or India or both? in relation to, uh, to agri-food trade between the two nations? Well, I, I would, you know, I'm, we're not in the, in the um, business of telling governments what to do. We're in the business of making sure business uh, moves between the two countries. So I, I think as you look at it as a whole, one of the things that as I go around the world, I was just in Brazil last week. Uh, I was back in Southeast Asia uh, the week before that. And I come back to Canada it is amazing what we have. And when you look at agriculture, we are, it is one of our superpowers that we sometimes almost try to um, keep quiet. And the numbers speak for themselves and the, and the future numbers speak for themselves. But, you know, it is one of our greatest assets. It's one of our greatest superpowers as a country. And we need to not only understand it better as a people, but also embrace it. And so if we can just appreciate, understand what we currently have, um, then we're all of a sudden going to look at the world with very different eyes. And I think that's important because the world needs our agriculture. And in the midst of um, uh, geopolitical tensions in the Middle East, in in Europe um, and a number of other places in the world, uh, we are one of those countries that in many ways is, is located in, in a safe jurisdiction in the world, has some of the highest quality um, food in the world, and has great trade relationships and great trade routes with the world. And Canadians need to understand and appreciate what we have to be able to make sure that we get it out to the rest of the world because the world needs what we have. And mm -hmm. that is especially true around agriculture. Mm -hmm. um, I'll, I'll ask one more question and then I'll throw it back to, to Michael to, uh, to, to uh, get us home. Um, how do you see uh, Canada's relationship with India and vice versa over the next, say, 10 years from now? Like, uh, What are some of the trends that you're you're uh, focusing on right now and uh, are we going in the right direction basically regardless of what's going on with uh, with geopolitics yeah I think I think as I said I think the next 10 years for the Canada India Business Council will be the most exciting um, India is on that trajectory of third largest economy in the world and my hope is Canada can have a meaningful relationship as it ascends to where it'll ascend right so we shouldn't wait till India's on the economic podium of the world to build a stronger relationship. We should, we should be doing that, you know, right now, because we know it's going there. We know the opportunities, we know the complementarity of the two economies. And so my hope is that um, the diplomatic distractions that have been there all get dealt with. And just like Australia has done the last five, six years has, you know, has made a significant pivot um, from a business standpoint, from a government to government standpoint, and from a cultural standpoint, to actually be able to harness 
and engage um, the country. One of the things that I've been very excited about when it comes to agriculture, and it's not on the traditional side, it's more on the technology side, is there's a Canadian company called um, Clean Scene Capital. And they've entered into a technology license and manufacturing agreement with Mahindra um, Group, but specifically Mahindra Tractors, which is now the largest tractor company in the world. And they're basically looking for Mahindra to manufacture and distribute their smart Cedar Mini Max um, system uh, with clean seed in India. So if you look at the current agricultural landscape in India, farms are very small and very primitive. And so they, if you think of the scale and technology that Canada has, it's almost completely the opposite. And so this is just one example where you're seeing uh, Canadian technology tie in with one of the largest, well, the largest tractor company in the world, um, which will see um, a greater use of and a higher product productivity of that, that specific farm, um, but those farms at scale. And so I think, I think there's a lot of opportunities for on the ag tech side, on the precision farming side, to actually bring some of those things in and to um, see far greater yields. And that's a collaboration that can, again, business to business that can happen now. And I hope some of our, our farmers, some of our ag tech folks are starting to think of this because the scale and size is so much smaller, but the, the number of farms is so much greater. And so mm -hmm. as, as we almost rethink some of the things that we think for, take for granted here in Canada, if we actually start looking at those farms and saying, okay, how do, how do we actually improve those yields? How do we improve the efficiencies and the effectiveness? Um, what are the ways we can, you know, enable things like smartphone, which smartphones, which India does have um, at scale and, and, you know, LTE technology, how do we leverage those things to actually see greater and, and this uh, clean sea capital and Mahindra group, um, agreement is one example where we're starting to see those things. And I hope to see, you know, dozens of those kinds of partnerships in, in the years ahead on the egg side. Well, it's a good jumping off point for my last question. Our last question is, is advice. Uh, what advice do you have for one your best piece of advice? We're all sitting down uh, for dinner and you've got a table full of agribusiness executives. What's your one most important piece of advice to uh, expand their reach in India? Uh, I would just say food is a sensitive topic and governments need to invest for the short and long term. And by actually having a framework, um, be it, uh, you know, we're, we're of course advocating for early progress agreement, but actually a comprehensive agreement with India where those things are all outlined, are clear and give companies um a framework in which they can clearly, you know, invest, but also trade with the country. And from the Indian side, you know, our, our answer to them is that if you, if you get something like that with Canada, you then open up, we have free, mm. we, we have free trade agreements with all G7 countries, and it could be a portal for you in terms of all of your trade, especially with the Western world. And mm. so, um, you know, we, we're a trading nation, uh, we, we're export-driven markets. Agriculture is one of our superpowers, and we need countries that, like India that have uh, an innate opportunity to do a lot more and to source a lot more from this country. Um, so ideally having some kind of peace or some kind of regulatory peace or some kind of agreement in place um, mm -hmm. specific to agriculture will, will set the table for years and decades to come between the two is, countries. Is there anything you can think of that businesses, business executives can do in the agribusiness, not politicians but re, and not regulators? But until those, are, are you advocating that they talk to their local MP and that they kind of say this is a big opportunity, make sure they don't lose track of that? What would your one piece of advice be to the, you know, the folks running the businesses that look to grow? Yeah, I, I think the my advice to the executives are, Go and see and understand the market. Mm, if mm. if you if you've seen it's complicated, it is complicated. If you've heard it's okay. complex, it is complex. You're but until wrong. you go and yeah. see the the vastness of the market mm -hmm. and and the complementarity of the of the two countries, 
Mm -hmm. um, then you'll find ways to make it happen. And that's what businesses do. And is that something your organization helps facilitate? Of course. We have uh, business groups um, going back and forth all the time. So, uh, right. yeah, Fantastic. get in touch with us. Uh, you know, trade, trade commissioner service through Global Affairs. But um, mm -hmm. go and check out the opportunities, see where you can fit in and, and participate. There's nothing like actually doing business. Feet in the ground. Great advice. Uh, and how do people get in touch with you? So are you a LinkedIn person, Victor? And, and what's the best way to get in touch with you or your organization if they want to pursue and uh, learn more? We're on LinkedIn. We're on um, uh, mm -hmm. address info at canda-indiabusiness.com. Mm -hmm. We're on, um, you know, you can send a, you can send old fashioned piece of mail to our address in Toronto or, or find any way to communicate with us. We will, um, we will be happy to connect you with whomever and uh, help you look at the market um, holistically to, to see what's best. But we think in the long run, pretty significant opportunities. Well, uh, clearly you're excited about the opportunity and uh, couldn't think of anybody better to have on the pod to discuss uh, the future. So thanks so much for joining Sylvain and I on the Food Professor podcast. Real interesting uh, discussion and uh, interesting days ahead for sure and lots of opportunity lots of competition so uh, i guess the the message coming out of this is uh, don't wait uh, don't wait for for that opportunity to come knocking on the door because it might knock on somebody else's door so uh, giddy up and get going victor thanks so much for being <laughs> on the pod thank you michael thank you so much great pleasure to be here all right so uh, that was great interview uh, in terms of understanding india now you know this is the last, not the last time you and I speak, but we won't be speaking once a week. I don't know what you're going to be up to this summer, but I have an idea of where I'm going to be. What would you do for a timbit? When the night is cold and the light is gone. Oh, man. Sometimes it Are you going to go? That's right. There is Timbit, the musical producer association with uh, some guy who is some kind of producer from, um, from away, uh, inspired by real Canadian stories. The last Timbit I'm reading from this script, obviously, follows a group of strangers who wait outside the snowstorm of the decade in the Tim Hortons hilariously heartfelt new musical. Unlikely group comes together to explore family, community and finds the best at hard times, all while battling for the last birthday cake. Timbit, June 26th to the 30th at Elgin theater here in toronto oh my god i'm just Are angling go? for free tickets i'm angling for free tickets so tim hortons oh. if you're listening to this duncan if you're listening to this you know invite me along michael we'll needs tickets <laughs> that's right <laughs> anyway yeah. if you thought you saw everything for the summer you were wrong there is now a tim hortons musical dedicated to the tim bit that's and it what's it's called more than the filling is that is that what <laughs> <laughs> it's called the, the last, last tim bit because they fight over the last birthday cake timbit so there you go uh, and where is it playing at the elgin theater in toronto so yeah you know, isn't there isn't there like a starbucks uh, right next to it <laughs> <laughs> there might be but yeah uh, you know i gotta give i gotta give tim hortons and we have give tim and tim hortons their due you know yeah. there was a time and, where and they by the lost... way i've actually checked mm. whether or not in new york or anywhere else there's been a musical about a food chain Yes. And I couldn't find anything. I, I ah. saw one. There has been one musical. Actually, there is one musical in New York uh, about a waitress. Huh? That's okay. all. That's all I found. Well, snap. There you go, Tim Hortons. Like, we've been yeah. impressed, actually, by uh, Tim Hortons uh, lately. Uh, they yeah. lost the script there for a while, but uh, we think they've got it back on. You know, the, oh, the, yeah. Bieber, Tim, the Bieber Tim bit and all these things. I think they're. You know, I, I'd be curious. We got to get somebody on. I'm curious to see how that pizza thing is going. I mean, they tested it for a while, and I heard it's going well. Oh well, good, yeah, good for them. I heard it's going very well. All right, yeah. well, good for them. Uh, yeah. well, maybe we will get somebody on in the in the fall. So, um, and we also trying to get a very senior person from Starbucks on. Since you mentioned Starbucks, uh, I'm going to shout. I don't think she listens to the pod. Lynn Castonge, who's been on before. Oh yes, we talked to her when she was at Saputo, but now she's the big Kahuna, uh, That's creating right. stuff Starbucks. at Starbucks. So. Uh, Lynn, if you're listening, come on the pod. We want to know what you're oh, doing. Oh yes. Uh, well, let's, uh, this is a uh, this is uh, fun and and a little bit uh, you know a little bit sad too. You and I, I won't know. be on the mic, uh, but uh, again, 
to the listeners. You and I had so many great interviews. Sometimes I did it, but mostly you and you and I were both there at the same time. I think for the vast majority of them, yep. such interesting people in Seattle. It's a real treasure trove, and we're going to bring it to you each and every week over the summer. Uh, so yep. get ready, get ready for that. But uh, until then, I'm Michael LeBlanc, consumer growth consultant, media entrepreneur, and a bunch of other things. And you are. I'm the food professor, Sylvain Chalabois, and I want to wish all of you a happy and safe summer. But where's the take care? Oh, geez. Take care. <laughs> <laughs> take care. There you go. All right, everybody, uh, stay tuned for more, and we'll come back uh, to you both of us on the mic in the fall for more of this uh, you know, Peabody winning stuff. So anyway, take care, everybody. <laughs>